welcome to the third session of this lesson on stewardship. And we carry on looking at a few thoughts from the scriptures as we begin to establish God's intent for man and how that God from the word God intended for man <clears throat> to be a steward and not an owner as man exists on earth. Now, we established in the last session, and I encourage you to go back and look at it, in session number two, we established that we are living in a world where the environment has conditioned us to want to own as much as we can. And this is for purposes of relevance and security. We are seeking for power. We are seeking for prominence. We are seeking for popularity. And the only way for us to rise to power, the only way for us to come to prominence, the only way for us to come to popularity and fame is to own as much as we can. You know, a few years ago, I had uh, a gentleman, I'm not sure I can remember his full name, but uh, uh, I had them, a gentleman talk about something was calling the popularity syndrome. And you know, I, I, I can't better define this generation than that. We seem to be suffering from popularity syndrome. All we want is to be popular. And so whatever it takes that can make us popular, we are going for it, no matter what it is. And that's exactly where we are. We are living in an environment that has conditioned us to want to own. And so all that we do is to endeavor to own. We are trying to own this. We are trying to own that. We are trying to own this. You know, and, and really, we are almost we're in a rat race trying to own uh, whatever we think can give us significance, can give us value, prominence, popularity, and so on and so forth. We also established that continuously, uh, the environment places a demand on us to want to own what belongs to God. We do know, and we looked at it in the scriptures, that everything belongs to God. He is the source of all things. He is the creator. But really, we are trying to own what already has an owner. God owns everything, and we want to own that which he already owns. All right? We're trying to make a statement of independence and, you know, a statement of personal ability. We are living to prove a point. It's a statement of who we are based on what we own. All right? We're trying to be in charge. We're trying to, you know, uh, express and show our ability and capacity. And all this, unfortunately, is in things. So consequently, man no longer views God as owner of all things. Man neither does not pursue God's pattern for his life. All right? Man does not consider God to be the source. So man has chosen to be independent. Man no longer lives to glorify God. Man lives for his own glory. And so to understand the context of these things that I'm saying here, I'll encourage you to go back and listen to uh, part one and two of this lesson on stewardship. And we began asking ourselves, what is this pattern that God intended for man to live by that was lost at the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter number 3 when man fell? And can we recover that pattern? All right? We did establish that God decided from the word God to include man in his eternal plan so that man can replicate God, that man can mirror heaven on earth. Remember in Genesis chapter 1 and from verse number 1, God made heaven, the heavens and the earth. Okay? A spiritual realm and a physical realm. Alright? God proceeds on in verse 26 to make man. So through this man, he will manifest on earth what is in heaven. That's why Jesus comes years later and says, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so how does the kingdom come and the will of God is done on earth? It's through man. So God intended for his son, man. Remember, man was created as a son of God. God intended for his son to replicate on earth what was in heaven and to manage earth by the principles that are heavenly, by his principles. Okay, that God will handle the earth and reflect the dominion, the majesty the reign, the rule of God on earth. That's how 
his kingdom, his majesty, his glory is revealed on earth. And uh, we went on to establish a number of things which I would encourage you to take time to look at it as you build a case on the original intent for the creation of man and that God intended for man to glorify him. Now, after creating man, that is now spirit, which is in chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 27, when it says, let us create man in our image after our likeness, okay? Now, after created man, chapter, uh, chapter 1, 27 says, uh, in his image and his likeness, God created man. Male and female created he them. All right? So, after creating man in his image and likeness, that is a spirit man, God went further and formed a body from the dust. That's now Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. He went ahead and formed a body. He formed man from the dust. That's the body. So he created man in chapter 1. That creating man there is spirit. Man, spirit. Then he went on and formed man. Formed man. That is the body. That is in chapter 2, verse number 7. The same note, he breathed into that body. He breathed in that body. Man became a living being. That is the soul. So it is easy to understand when you talk about that, that man is a tripartite, a tripartite son. Man is spirit, soul, and body. You can see how that process you know, was carried out. So in chapter 2, verse number 7, Genesis, man becomes a living soul. And then God takes man, the tripartite son, man in his image and likeness, and God places him in the Garden of Eden so that, it, so that man can advance the divine agenda. Okay? So man was not put in the garden for himself. He was put in the garden by God for God. So that in the garden, he can advance the agenda of God. Now, God is perfect and all his ways are perfect. And so his desire is a perfect desire and that desire will be a perfect benefit for man. You see, it's, God is not like man. When a man puts you in, in his garden, he puts you in that garden for himself, which is for his own benefit and selfish end and desire. God did not need anything physical. God did not need anything material. All he wanted is to give man that which is material and physical, for him to enjoy, but also that same man to reveal the dimension of God in the physical realm and bring the perfection of God in the physical realm. So God intended for man to live in an environment that is free of corruption. Free of corruption. And so God takes the man and puts him in the garden. And God gives man responsibility in the garden. Now, let's follow something here. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 to 8. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 7 to 8. And we're going to read and then we'll jump to 15 to up to 17. And it says, <clears throat> And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Now, I have taken time to explain that. And the Lord God formed man. That's the physical aspect. All right. For he formed him of the dust of the ground. Took the dust, formed man, the body. Breathed into his nostril. Became a living life. A breath of life became a living soul. That is a living being. Lana. That's the soul of a man. Look at what happens in verse 8. <coughs> the Lord God planted a garden eastward. And there in the garden, he put the man whom he had formed. The Lord God planted a garden. So it is not man who planted the garden. Man did not have a hand in this. God decided the position where to place the man. He determined where to place the man. He planted a garden eastward in Eden. And then what happens? There in that garden which God planted. So it is God's garden. Okay. And God takes his man puts him in his garden, the man he had formed. So both the garden at this point 
and the man belong to God. Now look at verse 15. Genesis 2 verse 15 through to 18. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep. To tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded them saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. But in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God ships the man, God molds the man, puts him in the garden as a living soul. Then he puts him there. Why? So that he can work. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that work is not a result as a result of the fall. Work began before the fall. Jobs came after the fall. But work was before the fall. And there's a big difference between job and work. Work has got to do with the ability that God has given you. Work has got to do with you expressing and revealing the glory of God. Work has got to do with an opportunity for you to express the talent that blood is in you. Work has got to do with worship to God. Work has got to do with honor and service to God. Work is not about your development, in your advancement rather. All right? And your selfish personal benefit. Work is about glorifying God. Work is connected to the divine agenda. So it is connected to divine ability within you because that divine ability is what becomes the power that advances the divine agenda. But people will look for a job for sustenance, self, self, self-preservation. And so God puts in man to work. And I want to encourage everyone here to work. Find something to do. Don't say there are no jobs. Jobs can lack, yes, but work never lacks. You can't just sleep there if you can draw. Wake up, take a pencil and draw something. Find something to do. There is work everywhere. There's work everywhere. And so God puts the man. Actually, he establishes the profession of farming right there. He put him in the garden to tend it and to keep it. And people are running away from farming, but there it is. Tend it and keep it. Wise people in these last days are going back to farming. That's where wealth is. Farming. Tend it and keep it. Then he puts boundaries for man. Because life has boundaries. He says you shall eat everything except. Why? Because God wanted man to learn to depend on him. To obey. Not because he must. Not because he has to. But because he's willing. Where man has a choice. God gives man right there. The will to choose. Eat everything except this one. So you can choose to eat or not eat. So God gives man the power of choice right there. Very interesting. That's how benevolent God is. That's how good God is. He gives man the power of choice. He says you can choose to disobey or obey. You can choose to do or not do. But I want you to to do this because you have chosen to. The power of choice. Power of choice. It's amazing how we, we think that God, you know, is so selfish and so limiting. He is denying us from enjoying life. Yeah, he, God doesn't want us to enjoy life. Young people think God doesn't want us to, to enjoy life. Why? Because he's telling you not to get involved into sex, with sex. That's just one area, my friend. Why don't you consider the many other things that God has allowed you to do? He says, of the tree, uh, and, and the Lord commanded the man saying, I'm in mean, verse number 16, and the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Every, but of the tree of life and death, of of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Because I do not want you to operate with your own intellect. I want you to operate with a higher level of life. That tree is of a lower level of life, knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to operate at that level. I want you to live by revelation knowledge, not intellectual knowledge of what is good and evil. Okay? And so... God put them, puts the man right there in the garden, gives the man responsibility. Now, that there, to tend and to keep, has got to do with working, has got to do with serving, okay? Has got to do with protecting. The word to tend, some versions will say to dress, to tend, to dress, is the word abad, which is to work, which is to serve, which is to till. Serve the garden, till the garden. Then keep it, shama. He says to, to guard, to protect to hedge. So man had to work on the garden and protect the garden. 
man had to till the garden and to guard it. Man had to build a hedge, had to, had to shield it. Guard from what? Make sure it is well kept. It's well attended to. The right word there actually is to attend to. Work and attend to it. All right? The word tend there is to work. The word keep there is attend to. So God put the man in the garden to work on it and attend to it. Manage it. All right? So he's simply saying this. I place you there for purposes of management. Manage it well. Keep the garden well. Keep it the way it's supposed to be. Keep the way it should be. Keep it the way I would do it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> notice that God did not give the man the garden. God did not give the man the garden. He didn't say, I have given you the garden. No. In fact, the only word give there is a uh, 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 of, of, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. It's like saying I have given you for food. You may freely eat. I have allowed you to access. I want you to notice something here. God did not give the man the garden. God gave man access to the garden. Access the fruit of the garden. God gave man access, not ownership. So two things responsibility and access. First thing, he puts him there and says, take responsibility. Secondly, have access to whatever is in that garden for your own good. Benefit from the garden that you manage. As you manage it and become responsible, benefit. God has no problem. Benefit. You know, benefit. So God did not give the man the garden. Rather, he put him in it to take care of it. All right? So God remained the owner and he made his son the manager. So the garden has an owner and the garden has a manager. And the father and the son work on the garden. The father is the owner. The son is the manager. The father is the owner. The son is the attendant. The father is the owner. The son is the caretaker. The father is the owner. The son is the steward. The son was to manage his father's estate. He was to manage his father's territory, his father's property, his father's wealth. You see, I have never seen any of my children give me one shilling, one Kenya shilling to top up, to buy my car, not one. Now, after I buy my car, they call it our car. Yeah, it's their car. It's, our, it's no longer mine. When I'm buying, it's mine. And, and, you know, it's our car. And they talk about our car. I haven't seen them come and add me one shilling to, for house rent. But it's our house. It's our house. All right? Now, that aspect of our is simply because they belong to me. So because they belong to me, they have access to the car. They have access to the house. All right? Actually, they have unlimited access. So the sense of ownership is not ownership to profile themselves, it's not ownership for them to have a sense of importance. It is ownership in the sense of responsibility. We have a responsibility over this house. We have a responsibility over this car. All right? While I will fuel the car, I don't clean it. They will clean it. While I'll pay the rent of the house, I don't wash it. They will wash it. That's what we're talking about. They are responsible. That sense of responsibility makes them feel, you know, they have a sense of ownership. Now, that sense of ownership is different from the sense of ownership that is introduced to us by the Babylonian mindset. The ownership of I, belonging to me. Belonging to me to profile me. Now, 
ownership should be actually in the sense of I'm responsible for this. It's ownership in the context of responsibility. Now, similarly, the father is the estate owner. The garden belongs to him. But his son is the estate manager. He's a steward. Now, that's how God intended to work with man from the word God. God did not design and configure man to own. He designed and configured man to be a steward. That's why man is a very poor owner of anything. And that's why man, when man began pursuing to own, man will never have enough. You will never come to a point and feel you have enough. You always want more. You always want to own something more. Because you're not configured to do so. Okay? So God's original idea in the unfolding of his plan was for man to be a responsible manager of his estate, not to own it. The man and the estate both belong to God. There's no way Adam is going to own the garden. The garden belongs to God. Adam belongs to God. So both Adam and God belong to God. So Adam cannot claim to own what already belongs to God. But Adam has been given the privilege to manage what belongs to God and to enjoy the benefits as he manages what belongs to God. He has been given access to all that which is in that estate. Beloved, it's more powerful when God trusts you and gives you access than when you try to own things for yourself. I'm telling you the truth. And this is God's design and this is God's desire. That as a son of God, you have access to all that he has created. He created all these things for the benefit of his son, for the enjoyment of his son, for the pleasure of his son. He created all things. And then after that, he created man. Because all things were created as an inheritance for the son. Because it belongs to the father. Very important. So God... God's idea for his son was stewardship, not ownership. Mature sons, as you walk with the Lord and come to a place of maturity as a son of God. Because you see, once you get born again, you must embark on a journey of maturity. You begin to mature in your identity as a son of God. That you're able to think as a son, behave as a son, reason as a son of God. In other words, you're able to govern your life and govern your affairs, and govern and, and, and have dominion in your sphere of influence, and govern your jurisdiction with the principles of the kingdom of God. All right? You are, you are developing and progressively, you are able to turn away from worldly and carnal and traditional and religious principles that, of governing, of governance, and you're beginning to run, you know, to learn rather, how to govern your life, Govern your finances, govern your relationships, govern your marriage, govern your children, govern your husband. You, you are learning how to govern your government, govern your area of influence, and govern your own life by biblical principles. You are more and more conforming to Christ. The image of God in you is becoming more and more visible. All right? That's what maturity basically is about. So maturity is not about owning things. Okay? Maturity is not about, uh, you know, having some gifts and, you know, being able to operate in those gifts. It's more than that. It has to go to the formation of the character of Christ in you and the ability to make decisions in a manner that is consistent with the word of God. Not making decisions based on how people influence you or what you hear people say, or what people tell you. I mean, not everybody who stands there to preach will make every statement and is accurate. Some of the statements, you have to weigh them in the word. So maturity is the ability to make decisions, to scan and to judge in the light of the word of God. Now, as you progress on to maturity and become a mature son, mature sons seek to be better and more responsible managers of God's estates, not owners. Mature sons of God seek to be better and more responsible managers of God's estate, not owners. So that as you progress in Christ and become more like Christ, you don't seek to own. You seek to be a better 
and more responsible manager. You begin to separate yourself from the things that are called by your name. That, that, that your significance and your value and worth and importance is not attached to anything you own or don't own. You suddenly begin to realize that your value, your significance, your worth is in him who created you. Is in your identity as a son of God. It's wrapped up in your nature as a son of God. All right? And so you stop seeking to own things to find fulfillment. And begin to realize that actually fulfillment is attained in stewardship. Fulfillment, satisfaction, ladies and gentlemen, is in stewardship, not in ownership. There's nothing you'll ever own and feel satisfied. When you own this, this demands that you own that. The moment you own this, the this demands that you own that. The moment you get that, the that demands that you get that other. So you're always chasing after. It's no fulfillment. And even when you, you, you feel happy, pleasure and, and happiness is momentarily. But if you come to the place of stewardship, and down deep in you, Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of my Father. When you know I am managing this thing the way God would want me to manage it, that is what brings fulfillment. That's what brings satisfaction. And that actually is where success lies. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> the desire to own stems from a deep-rooted identity crisis. I'm going to say that again. The desire to own is subtly rooted in a very deep sense of identity crisis. Oh yes, the desire to own stems from a deep rooted identity crisis. We seek for worth and significance in things rather than from our source. We want to have so as to be known, so as to be recognized and celebrated. We want to own. I want you to come and see my house that you can celebrate me. I want you to see my good house, my big house, my big car that you can celebrate me. We want to own so that we can be known, recognized, and celebrated. It's about us. But God did not give, put money in the garden for any of those reasons. God did not put Adam in the garden for him to be known, for him to be recognized. For him to be celebrated. There was no one to know him. No one to recognize him. No one to celebrate him. Only God. So God put man there for himself. For a divine purpose. Ladies and gentlemen. I submit to you. Whatever God commits to you. Is for a divine purpose. Whatever God entrusts you. Is for a divine purpose. That is God's agenda. But when you are preoccupied with. You know fighting this. That's why we have all these competitions. That's why we have many people corrupting the gospel. Because you want to own. I want to own the largest congregation. I, I want to own a, the, the biggest car. I want to own the biggest chunk of land. I want to own the biggest house in, the, in town. I want to be famous and popular. As the, as the, you know, uh, as the, as the man the biggest congregation. No, what for? Because I'm trying to profile myself. That's not how God intended it to be from the beginning. That's a fruit, that's a result of the fall. That's a result of the fall. It is God who was to give man what God considered worth and good for man. Jesus gives a parable of this king who was going to a far country. And he called three men. The Bible says he gave them his talents. He called his servants. All right? A king was going for. He called his servants. And he gave to his servants. What did he give to his servants? He gave his servants talents. His own talents. Very interesting. He calls his own servants to him. He gives them his own talents. Each according to their ability. Each according to their ability. Five, two, and one. It is the master who knows our abilities. 
We will never be equal, ladies and gentlemen. We will never be equal. Jethro advised Moses, appoint leaders over tens, over fifties, over hundreds. We will never be equal. Some will oversee tens. Others will oversee fifties. Others will oversee hundreds. Others will oversee thousands. We will never all be equal. Some will have more money. Some will have more property. Some will have more wealth. Some will administrate more resources than others. But listen, the thing is not in the how much you administrate. It's in the how you administrate what you have. The one who had the five came back and brought five more. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the rest of your master. The one who had two came back and brought two more. His 100% was lesser than the beginning point of the other one. Can you believe it? He has done 100%. He has produced 100%. He has four. But the other guy, his beginning point was even higher than this man's 100%. But look at what the master says. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in the master's rest. Both of them get the same reward. What was the Lord rewarding? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Because they had different capacities. But they operated by the same principle. A kingdom principle. A heavenly principle. Faithfulness. Now faithfulness is a language used in stewardship. It is required in stewardship that a man be found faithful. So these were good stewards. Then comes in another fellow who had the one. And he says, I know you too well. I knew you were a hard man. I hid it in the ground. And he is called wicked. Why? Because he was given according to his ability. But he did nothing. He was not a good steward. He was not faithful. Ladies and gentlemen. I submit to you. That God configured you. Built you. And constructed you. For purposes of stewardship. Not ownership. This desire to own is what makes us compete with one another. Fight one another. Kill one another. Man will kill the other to own their piece of land. Man will kill another man to own his woman, his wife. You know, woman will kill another woman to own her man. We want to own. So what do we do? We kill. We steal. We'll, we'll give you a job as a politician. You get into parliament. You want to own. So you get into corruption. The desire to own is what gives birth to corruption. Greed. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that, 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 that uh, greed is as a result of this desire to own. But if we begin looking at life as stewards, that we are stewards, that God wants us to be stewards of his resources, when we begin to free ourselves from the pressure of wanting to own things, and we just become faithful to multiply what we have, it will keep increasing. The man had five, now he has ten. In fact, eleven. Because Jesus said, the master said, take the one he has and give it the one who had five. Now who has ten? So he has eleven. The man is increasing. The man is multiplying. He has more now. Why? He is faithful. Even the, even the ten, he looks at it as a steward. So as, as he multiplies it, he benefits. Benefit. So that's what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen. God's desire for man and for you and I was to know him and make him known through you. Right? Make himself known, brother. God's desire was one, for you to know him and secondly, for him to make himself known through you. The principle by which God reveals himself through you. The principle by which God reveals himself to other men through men. Is a principle of stewardship. How you steward, how you manage, how you handle the gift, the grace, the talent, the ability, the resources he has put in you. As you become a faithful steward, you have heard of, uh, you know, a situation where someone just walks in the morning, knocks the door to a neighbor and gives them some stuff for breakfast. And the neighbor says, today I have seen the Lord. 
Now, why does the man say he has seen the Lord? He, the man sees the Lord because the other one, the neighbor, was a good steward. He became faithful. Became faithful. That's good stewardship. So in stewardship, God is revealed. I want to challenge us to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. This is how we reveal the glory of God. This is how we reveal the nature of God in stewardship. All right? And so, before the fall, before the fall, man was a good steward. Okay? Before the fall, man was a good steward. Let me say this. Before the fall, man managed God's garden. He was a manager of the garden of God. That was the mindset. That was the attitude. That's what I'm saying. As you mature, you go back that default mode. You go back that initial desire. So when man fell, after the fall, man destroyed everything that he was supposed to be taken care of. What does he do when he falls? He begins to cut the same fig tree to cover himself. All right? So before the fall, man was a good manager. He kept it and tended the garden. He was a good manager of the garden. But after the fall, man destroyed the plants for his own preservation. He cut fig trees to cover himself. That's what happens. That's what happens. When you're a good manager, ladies and gentlemen, you use what you have to bring glory to God. But when you are a poor manager, you use what you have for, own, for your own selfish preservation. And that's what is happening. We think about ourselves. We are so selfish. We just think about ourselves. The way to deal with the selfishness is to deal with the ownership mentality and bring back the stewardship mindset. So you have to recover the mindset and attitude of stewardship in your life. You have to bring, you have to become a responsible manager of what God has given to you. What belongs to God, but he has entrusted it to you. As a husband, realize that you are a steward of a, that daughter of God. That woman belongs to God, but he has committed her to you. Manage her well. Be faithful to her. Right? As a wife, that man is God's own child. He belongs to God. Handle him well. Those children you have, don't just think in terms of you gave birth to them. They belong to God. He has entrusted them to you. Manage them. Handle them well. Be good stewards. The house you have, the car you have, the money you have, the business you have, whatever it is that God has allowed you to, you know, to have, he actually, it is his. He has entrusted to you for management, for stewardship. As you steward, you will benefit. And as you steward it in a faithful manner, he will be glorified. As he gets glorified, you also benefit. So benefit. So don't be preoccupied with your benefit, but be preoccupied with the glory of God. How can I glorify God with my life? I want to handle my wife in a manner that glorifies God. I want to handle my husband in a manner that glorifies God. I want to do my business, handle my business. I want to handle money in a manner that glorifies God. Some of these simple things that God talks about in terms of money, he's, he's teaching us how to not to be owned by money and not to own money, but to be good stewards of money. Right? Yes. So don't waste money on drinking and prostitution and useless, careless things. Invest it wisely. Invest in the kingdom of God. Invest in that which is helpful for your children. Invest for the future of your family. Invest well. Can't just go about eating pizza every day. You can refuse to cook at home. That you can go eating in Ivers always. And you, you know, you, you've got to go and eat uh, in a hotel. That's irresponsibility. That's poor stewardship of the resources that God has entrusted to you. God gives you energy. God gives you strength. God gives you health. You work a whole month. Then God causes those people to remunerate you. So they remunerate you. Appreciate. This is a reward from the energy and the time that God gave me. Because you see, you did not wake yourself up. God woke you up. God gave you life. So don't just say, I woke up. This is my own sweat. Says who? Think about it. It's God who gave you time. He gave you days. 
Every day belongs to him. He gave it to you. He gave you time. He gave you skill. He gave you strength. He gave you capacity. He gave you ability. Nothing was yours. Which means what? Even the money that comes at the end of the month is not yours. Because it costs you nothing of yours. Oh yes. You are a steward of that job. A steward of that money. Handle it in a way that glorifies God. Work that work. Work in that job in a manner that glorifies God. Whatever it is you do. Do you sell potatoes? Tomatoes? In a hotel? In an office? You fly planes? You drive cars? You drive trucks? Whatever it is that you do, beloved, I encourage you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, consider yourself a steward in that field, in that front. You work in the building site? Construction site? Whatever you are. A leader? A politician? A manager? A preacher? These are privileges. These are positions of stewardship. So that in that field, in that front, we can glorify God. Because God intended for man to glorify him from the word God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you to recover the mindset and attitude of stewardship. We'll pick it up from there in the next session. As you look further into this matter, prosecute it more right from the scriptures and pray that by the end of it all, you'll be a better steward in life. And listen to me, God rewards faithfulness. The King bless you, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.